morning to worship this morning. A special word of welcome to any of you who are guests today. We're especially glad that you're here, and we look forward to sharing in this time of worship together. I invite you to register your attendance on the cards that are available in the order of service. Uh, we'll collect those during the offering time. And if you are new to this church, I also want to extend an invitation to you to join us at our next welcome lunch, which will be held at, uh, on September 17th. Uh, following this service. So if you would like more information about that, you can note that uh, on the connection card as well. A number of announcements uh, today. First of all, uh, Greg, if you could talk with us about uh, adult education. September 5th, Vespers resumes, and our Tuesday evening adult classes will also resume that night, uh, September 5th. You have in your order of worship, by the way, a white sheet that shows you all of this. Um, is the last in our study on diversity uh, through their eyes, experiences of Mexican immigrants in Green Bay, Wisconsin. If you don't have a copy, it's a thesis, you can get one in the office and then join us on September 5th for the discussion. Then Tuesday nights, the 12th, we begin the adult classes after Vespers with uh, Ruben Job's little book called Three Simple Rules. And you can also get those for $5 in the church office beginning next week and we'll look at those for four weeks in September and early October. Then I'm really excited about this. Thursday mornings we're going to start uh, something a little different and new. There will be a book study on Richard Moore's book, Everything Belongs, and there will be two sections of it, a 10.30 in the morning section and then a Thursday evening, 6.30 section of, of that book. So again, obtain the book, maybe read the first 30 or so pages and then pick one of those two times, either 10.30 or 6.30, and join us for the discussion. There are sign-ups uh, for those on the welcome table as you leave today. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind you that um, we're putting on a congregational art festival at the beginning of October as part of our stewardship season. And so if you have uh, something that you can share, uh, as a part of that festival, we hope that you will do so. You can pick up a registration for that on the patio today. Uh, Diane Davis, who's uh, on vacation right now, asked me to especially remind the children that next week we're going to have a special blessing of your backpacks as school begins. So uh, be sure to bring those with you to church next week. And finally, it's with great sadness that we share with you the news that uh, we received that Shelley Rivers died suddenly like yesterday. Uh, our prayers and sympathies are indeed with her husband Jim and their entire family. And as plans are made to celebrate her life, we will share those uh, with you. But let us remember that family, of course, in our prayers at this time. Let's stand and greet one another.
faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice flows like the ocean's high. We will lift our voices to worship you, our God and King. We will find our strength in the shadow of your wings.
starting a new class, starting a new school, and a little scary. Is anybody kind of nervous? You're all just excited, can't wait to start a new great year and learn lots of wonderful stuff? Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. If you wake up tomorrow morning and your tummy hurts a little, and you're a little nervous, because all of a sudden you realize you might not know exactly what's going to happen that day, I want you to remember something. Right? You're, I want you to remember that you were nervous. I get nervous a lot, so like I'm talking about myself. Um, if you wake up and you're a little afraid about going, you can remember something. You can remember that you're not alone, right? Because who's with you? God. God is with you always. And so if you find yourself thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to go and I'm not going to know anybody, or I'm going to be wearing the wrong thing, or kids are not going to be kind to me, am I giving you things to worry about? <laughs> God is right there with you, and you can stop and say a prayer at any time. Did you know that? And you don't even have to put your hands together or anything. You can just say in your mind. You can just say, God, help me. I'm nervous and afraid. Amen. Did you know who's do that? I already know. <laughs> you know who's flashed, so you don't have to worry? Okay. Yeah? Well, that makes it less scary. You know, this can work for anything, not just school. So if you find yourself in another situation where you're a little nervous, you can just do that prayer. Nobody even has to know what you're doing. It's just between you and God. Okay. But right now, let's pray all of us together. Okay? Ready? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Help us remember. Help us remember. We're never alone. And you are here to help us. In Jesus' name, amen.
gospel lesson is from the 16th chapter of the gospel of Matthew, verses 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Let us stand and sing our next hymn, As a Fire is Meant for Burning, number 2237. You'll find that in the Faith of Saint. Voices. 
The teacher intended for them to visit the associate minister, whom they knew because she was the one who performed their chapel services every week. So after they visited her office, the teacher then headed to the front door, but the child in the front of the line turned left instead of right and headed into my office. And then like sheep, the whole class followed the leader, and they all paid me a visit. And so as the children circled their horses around my desk, the, the teacher caught up with them, and she came in and told them who I was, that I was a minister like the other woman they had just visited. And so after I learned the names of all their horses and they checked out my fish, the teacher then corralled them into two lines and proceeded to lead them out of the office. But there was one little blonde-haired boy at the end of the line who was taking his time as he looked at my bookcases and handled most everything that was on my desk. <laughs> and then, without inhibition, he came right up to the side of my chair, looked me in the eye, and asked, when will you come to the stage and tell us about God? <coughs> I thought that kid was just there to see the fish. And I don't remember what I had planned to do that day, but I was taken aback. How could such a simple question stir up so much inside of me? And what threw me was not only the innocence of his surprising question, but it was also the weight of what my answer should have been. That boy's question was imprinted on me that day because it defines so clearly the responsibility that followers of Jesus have to speak words of truth and hope to other people, even those who have no qualms about riding stick horses or speaking honestly to strangers. That encounter was what my southern friends in seminary would call my come-to-Jesus moment. Our passage today is a story of Peter's real come-to-Jesus moment. Jesus asked Peter pretty much the same question that that blonde cowboy asked me. For who do you say that I am is not that different than asking, when are you going to come to the stage and talk about God? Well, in this week's lesson, Jesus asked his disciples to tell the truth. He, he asked, who do people say that I am? It's an identity question. And this question asked in chapter 16 sets us up for this divine identification that happens a couple of chapters later when Jesus is transfigured on the mountain and God declares from heaven exactly who he is, saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And so this talk that Jesus has with his 12 disciples is a pivotal moment in Jesus' earthly ministry because it foreshadows the transfiguration. But where we are in the story this morning, that divine identification is yet to be. But what we have before us today is Jesus trying to gauge the efficacy of his ministry. And so he decides to take a poll of sorts. And he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he wants his disciples to do some critical thinking about the serious work that they have been called to do. They are not just to make people feel good about themselves. As followers, their job is to transform lives. So Jesus wants to know from the disciples if this is happening. Do people recognize that he is the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Savior, who has been promised. And so the disciples report, well, they're saying a lot of things. Some say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. And that one doesn't really make any sense because earlier in this gospel, Matthew demonstrated that Jesus was not John the Baptist because they were both present at the same time at Jesus' baptism. Another disciple reports, well, some say that because of your prophetic preaching, you might be Elijah. And people might think this because they know that in the Hebrew scriptures, the prophet Elijah never died. He just departed to heaven in a chariot. 
So maybe he's back. Another disciple said, well, with all the rabble-rousing you're doing, some have suggested that you are the second Jeremiah. In other words, the word around town is that Jesus is some sort of sequel to what they have known in the past. Now, in contemporary jargon, we might say that these people are not able to think outside of the box. They have trouble imagining God doing a new thing in Jesus. And so hearing the disciples' reports, Jesus pauses for a moment. And then he asks a more specific question of his small circle of disciples. He says, well, it's clear that crowds aren't getting it. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And what happens then is like what happens in most Methodist churches when someone asks for a volunteer to pray. All of the disciples' eyes look downward, so that they don't have to meet the eyes of their Savior. But leave it to Peter to break the awkward silence by raising his hand and declaring, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now coming from Peter, the, the one disciple who is ever eager to please, it does make you wonder if he is just talking without thinking, or if there is indeed some real conviction behind his words. You know, we've, we've reason to be suspicious. Just two weeks ago, we heard about Peter's short walk on the water and his rescue by Jesus. And perhaps that little dip in the water was actually a baptism that washed away his doubts and his impulsiveness. Maybe Peter has figured out who Jesus really is. Not according to the passage. Jesus makes it pretty clear that this affirmation of Peter's has come to him as a gift from God. Jesus acknowledges as much when he says that flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And the fact that Peter goes on to mess up so badly that Jesus likens him to Satan just a short time later is further proof that Peter is not on his own here. But that episode is an there's a story for another sermon. For now, I, I want us to stay in this moment when Peter makes his confession of faith because it really is a very precious moment between Jesus and Peter. Jesus blesses Peter, and he does this in the most touching way. He gives him a nickname that is going to set the course of his life. So after Peter makes his affirmation that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, Jesus gives Peter a new name. And he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now Jesus has a play on words going here. He, he names Simon Peter Petros, Peter, which actually means little stone. And it's said almost like an endearment, like, like saying, you're my little stone. It's not real romantic, but it's touching. And then in the same sentence, Jesus calls the church a Petra, or a rock. So we have a little stone, and we have a rock. And the connection that Jesus is making is that Peter is going to be an integral part of the establishment of the church following the resurrection. And so in spite of all of his frail humanity, Peter is blessed and given a major role in the building up of God's heaven on earth, the church. This was the new thing that God was doing in Jesus. Jesus established the church in order to offer real love and connection with God and other people. And all of these stories about the clumsy, vulnerable, wounded disciples remind us of the very human face of the church. The church has always been a gathering, and then later an institution made up of people who live in the tension between faith and doubt, between sin and forgiveness, between fear and courage, between selfishness and hope. That's one of the things that makes the church different than other institutions or even society as a whole. The church is built up by people of faith, but it is established and empowered and sustained by God. 
So for those of us today who make up the church, maybe a question is, is Peter is so much like us, so human, is this story of blessing and calling also our story? Does Jesus not ask each of us the same big question? Who do you say that I am? And our answer, however articulate or bumbling it may be, becomes another rock in the foundation on which the church continues to be built. Well, after Jesus blesses Peter, he then gives him a symbolic gift which speaks volumes about Jesus' intentions for Peter. And he promises him then with keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, the metaphor of a key can be thought about in two different ways. You could think about keys as a means of, pe of keeping people out, or you could just as easily see the key as a way to let people in. I think Jesus promised Peter, the leader of the church, the keys to the kingdom for the latter reason. Jesus was a door opener, not a door closer. And the keys to the kingdom are used to let those who are on the outside come in. For if the one with the church key doesn't open the door, then what use is the church? I want to tell you a story about three church keys. When the United Methodist Church gets a, a new minister, the process involves an introductory meeting between <coughs> the Staff Parish Relations Committee, and the new minister. Truth be told, it, it's not really an interview. It's more like a blind date that results in an arranged marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and the way that the meeting happens is that the designated minister enters an unfamiliar room filled with nervous and expectant church members who themselves have no idea who's going to walk in that room. Well, I have been through this a number of times. And on one particular occasion, Myra and I, and our two little boys at the time, had driven many hours to a town we had never heard of, and even had to locate on a map while we were getting a phone call to tell us that we were moving there. Mm -hmm. To add to the tension, we had a brand new baby who didn't take real well to being away from me. So when we were invited to walk in the door for that meeting, all three of us entered the room. All in all, the meeting ended up being an honest sharing of hopes and concerns laced with good humor. Our conversation lasted as long as the baby slept. <laughs> but at the conclusion of the meeting, the chair of the committee came over to us, reached into his pocket, and pulled out two keys, one for each of us. And he told us that this was our place now. So here was our key. It was a powerful gesture of hospitality and encouragement and hope about the future. At another appointment, our family arrived at the church late in the day after driving eight hours in heavy traffic. We were instructed to pick up the keys to both the church office and the parsonage that we were supposed to live in by the close of business on a particular day. So when we arrived, we found none of the keys were there. We were told that the parsonage key was with the volunteers who were still over there painting the interior, and the church key would be given to us after we filled out a key request form and put down a $5 deposit. <laughs> As it turned out, that was a church that had some trouble. <laughs> But another church I worked at gave every new member a key to the chapel. Doing that was not without a few risks, but the symbolism was wonderful. For when you join the church, you promise to give of your whole self, your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. You are invited to bring every bit of yourself into this new relationship with Jesus through the church. And so the church becomes your place now. You belong here. And every one of us has a contribution to make toward building the full realization of the kingdom of heaven. 
That is why at that church, everyone was given a key. It really matters what a church does with its key. stand with me as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God of love, the spirit of love and compassion, and now the breath and death of every human life. And I believe in the vision of Jesus, the reign of God on earth, and now where people and societies Creator God, we pray for those affected by the hurricane this weekend. 
He with those dealing with the fear and turmoil of the storm and its aftermath. Be with those responding to these emergencies. Keep them safe and their work productive and effective. And we pray for Laura Kitson receiving this prayer call today. May the prayers that we offer as we tie knots into this quilt bring healing of body, mind, and spirit. And for others whose names rest on our hearts, be they out of joy or with concern, congregation, I invite you to lift these names aloud and down. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. God of all creation, continue to transform our hearts in the days that come, that we may love generously. Transform our eyes that we might see your grace. Transform our hands that we might be in service to others. Forever give us the courage to answer your call and grant us the endurance to use our gifts that we might do your will always. Be with us today as we offer these words of prayer that Christ taught to us, saying, Our Father.
closing hymn, Marla and Pat will sing the first verse for us as this is our new